Our text this morning is from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 13. It reads like this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw... What seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space where heaven and earth meet. Amen. So in order for us to get back to this birthday of the church, the day of Pentecost, I want for us this morning to go way back to the beginning of the story of God and his people. We're going to go back to Genesis 11. And there's a story there that is important to understand as we try to understand uh, the day of Pentecost and what's happening in it, or at least part of what's happening in it. So Genesis 11, beginning in verse 1, it reads like this. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now this is a bit of an odd story, right? I mean, you can read it, and if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard it over and over again. But as you read it with kind of a, try to read it with a fresh mind, Um, at least for me, when I went back and read it again as I was getting ready for this message, I had to stop and think, okay, so what, what were they doing that was so terrible? Why was this so offensive to God? That they would build a tower or a city and all, and why was it so dangerous for them to speak one language and all of these different things? And that's another topic for another day. We don't have time to, to dive completely into it, but what I discovered or was reminded of is that God scattered the builders of Babel because 
of their desire to make a name for themselves. To make a name for themselves. Not a name for their God, a name for themselves. Their desire was to build an empire. Does that sound familiar? I mean, we have, through human history, suffered empire after empire after empire. And uh, what is the power of empire? Well, the obvious power is what? It's military might. And the will to use violence to subjugate other people, to expand your territory and all of that kind of thing, right? That's where we generally go. And that certainly is a part of the power of empire. But I would suggest that this text actually teaches us what somehow we innately already knew. And that is that actually the true power of empire is language and culture. It's having a particular way uh, to understand things, to communicate things, to name things, and to form people's understanding of those things. And so the power of empire is the power of language to, to uh, the power of language to enforce culture and hold power. Think about it. Every empire in the history of the world, this is part of the power that allows them to hold on to things, right? I mean, go all the way back to Alexander the Great, right? His empire stretched all over the known world. And the common language was Greek. The power of Rome... Sure, they were the mo- one of the most violent, vicious, and willing to use violence to, to enforce the Pax Romana, the peace, of Rome, the peace of Rome. Now, the peace of Rome was a phrase that they used, and essentially what it meant was, yeah, there's peace in Roman uh, colonies because you know darn well that if you should ever raise your head, it will be well and thoroughly crushed. That's the peace of Rome. But also, in the Roman Empire, they spoke Greek everywhere. And they, and they brought their culture with them so that there's those places where they went, that was part of the power. And over time, that culture took root. And it was easier for them to exercise power. Right? We could go through all the way through modern history and see those same principles at work in, in the empires that built the Western world. So then we come to the early church, who, which was born in the midst of an empire, right? The empire of Rome. That was part of the whole story of Jesus, what, part of what got Jesus into trouble was uh, this, this conflict between Rome and Judaism and an understanding of who was the true king. And so the church is waiting for the spirit that Jesus promised. And in, they're in the room, as, it, as the text tells us, and it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, those of us who have grown up in the church, I suspect this is the side of the miracle that we are most familiar with. When we think of the day of Pentecost, we think of the disciples speaking in languages that they didn't know, which is certainly an impressive thing, right? So the text tells us that the the Spirit filled them and they began to speak in other tongues that they didn't know. Now, you will have some disagreement Uh, depending on your tradition, about whether the gift of tongues in this instance was the gift of tongues of speaking in unknown languages, I think that is not correct. The text tells us that they spoke in known languages, and it didn't require interpretation, which, again, another sermon for another day, but speaking in tongues requires interpretation, right? So what happens is, 
is that they're speaking in other tongues. But here's the part that we generally don't focus as much on. In verse... um, Six, we first hear a clue to the other side of this miracle of Pentecost. Verse 6 says, When they heard this sound, the sound of the, of the mighty rushing wind, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. And then again in verse 8, it says... Um, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? I want to suggest to you that the greater miracle, or at least an equal miracle to the disciples speaking in other tongues, is what some theologians call hyper-intelligibility that happened on the day of Pentecost. You see, what happened on the day of Pentecost is the curse of the Tower of Babel is removed. Do you see that? All these cultures, it says. The text tells us that, that there were, there were God fearing Jews from every nation on earth. Maybe a bit of hyperbole, but there were a lot of different tribes and people and ethnicities and, and uh, countries represented. In fact, the, the text lists them for us in verses 9 through 11 Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Remember what happened at Babel is that God that God distributed the people And confused them in language so they couldn't understand each other. And now the power of the Spirit comes upon the church and erases that curse. Notice what he doesn't erase though. He doesn't erase the ethnicities. He doesn't erase the traditions. He doesn't erase the languages. He simply operates in such a way that each of those people understands what is being said. And then Peter goes on to declare the gospel to them. No interpretation was required. And no erasure of ethnic heritage or nation of identification or whatever those cultural markers are. There's no erasing that. It's simply a hyper-intelligibility. So Babel is erased. There is now no difference. It's an example, and and this becomes clear as we move through the New Testament, right? Think about the different places where Paul especially says that in Christ Jesus, there is no slave or free, man or woman, Jew or Greek, blah, 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 on and on. In other words, in Christ Jesus, we are one. There's another thread that gets wrapped up in this too. If you'll remember back at the beginning of the Gospels, John the Baptist, when he is preaching about Jesus and announcing the coming of Jesus, he says that a greater one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so on the day of Pentecost, that is fulfilled. In Pentecost, the Spirit is the force behind and through the major movement of the church and individuals. I think, I suspect, I could be wrong about this, so, you know, if you disagree, that's totally fine. But I suspect that part of the reason we really like the, the half of this story where the, where the disciples speak in other languages is because we hope that that might happen to us and we have, an act, we have activity in it. It's almost like uh, we, recognize, we want a piece of that. But what happens when we recognize that the real uh, second half of that miracle was that everybody heard in their own languages? Which means that if as many people are in this room, if we all spoke different languages, 
and I was speaking, even if I was speaking in a tongue that I didn't know, you would hear it in your own language and you would understand it. God is erasing those barriers. But the Spirit is the one who does the work. It's all about the Spirit. The unity of the church was accomplished by the sacrifice of Christ and is empowered and demonstrated by the Spirit at Pentecost. And we've just been trying to work it out ever since. Now, I'm not saying we've done a particularly good job in a lot of ways because we fall into line with empires and the church has fallen into line with empires over and over again through church history. As one of my church history professors said, whenever you see the church get in bed with government, it's the church that wakes up with fleas. Right? So we haven't always done a good job of allowing the Spirit to keep that unity among us that it, that it accomplished. Notice past tense. The unity of the church is not up to us. The unity of the church was accomplished by God. It's our, the only question is for us whether or not we're seeking to maintain that unity or whether or not we're contributing to that unity breaking down. And that can be a tough conversation. The unity of the church was accomplished by Christ. The question for us is are we participating in that unity or are we seeking to rebuild our own Babel? And make a name for ourselves. So what does this mean for us? How is it that this impacts our lives? Well, I want to highlight two things real quick in ways that it does this. We, as a part of the Covenant Church, we have six affirmations that we um, are kind of our central affirmations. They form the core of our beliefs. We're a non-doctrinal church, which means we don't have statements of faith. We have six affirmations. One of those affirmations is that we have a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. In other words, we believe that the only way that the church exists and is empowered is by the Holy Spirit. And so it is our job to have a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit to cultivate practices and, um, and learning and growth together that reminds us that it is the Spirit in us working through us, not anything we accomplish on our own. And so we seek to rely on that Holy Spirit. Now, I, I want to say, you know, one of the ways, there are a lot of different theological implications of that. And those are really helpful and important to have conversations about. But I think sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we can, um, we can get so enamored of those theological conversations that we lose sight of the very practical. So I want to just spend one second here. The longer I have followed Jesus, the longer I have followed Jesus, the more I have learned and the more I believe that most of discipleship consists of simple obedience to the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, that means that when you are going through life, when you are living in community, and you have that prompting, as Miss Kelly talked about in the children's message, that prompting, that voice, that uh, nudge that the Spirit gives you to make a phone call, to send a note, to shoot off a text, to reach out to somebody, to obey it. Because in obeying it, you will, you will be obeying the Holy Spirit. And the funny thing is, is the more we do that, the easier it gets to do. Now, I'm not standing here as one, like I'm going to pretend like, a, friends, I always obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Most, some of you know me well enough to know that's not the case. Right? But, but I'm convinced of it. I mean, listen, I believe in the importance of knowing the Scriptures and studying church history and knowing theology and all of those things. I've spent a lot of time pursuing that. 
But as far as following Jesus goes, the first step and the step that is so integral is that simple obedience to the Holy Spirit. And so what it means when we say that we are consciously dependent on the Holy Spirit is that we're seeking to cultivate that voice in our life and follow it and obey it. It really is that simple. And I submit to you that part of the transformation that we see in the book of Acts This massive move of the Spirit is because these folks, these early, those folks in the early church, they had some deep understanding of that simple obedience. And they followed it. And clearly, the Spirit was moving in a in a very powerful and unique way. But I believe it starts there. Second thing. One of the ways we're trying to lean into this here at Kent Cove and, and is we've identified our missional priorities for the next several years. One of those is this, what this series is all about. It's pursuing joyful wholeness, building community together, right? And the other we'll talk about in the fall, and that's loving our neighbors. But one of the things I'm convinced of is that if we're truly going to pursue joyful wholeness and seek to love this incredibly diverse community that we find ourselves in the middle of, we have to figure out what our welcome is and what it isn't. Now, that's a complex conversation. But what I'm saying to you is that it's partly, it's our job to make sure that we're doing that. And so one thing that we're doing to try to highlight that is, this, is the One Bread um, program or, or um, practice that we've started with communion. So basically, the idea behind this One Bread practice is that we're asking you all to, bring a bre- to provide bread for communion that represents your cultural heritage, right? So the first Sunday we did, uh, our, Gretchen and I provided rye crisp or kanika bread. Um, which is Scandinavian, right? We've had tortillas. We, Pastor Ruby brought naan. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have Swedish again with dark rye bread. We're going to have um, kavash from uh, Iran. We're going to have matzo from, a, from Jewish heritage, right? And it all represents the fact that in Christ we are one. It doesn't erase where we come from. That's the miracle of Pentecost, None of those people who heard them proclaiming the gospel in their own language, none of their cultures were erased. They were not brought in the church and said, okay, now leave all that behind. Now you become like us. No, they were a rich, diverse, multi-ethnic mosaic that that will make up the kingdom of God. And so what we're seeking to do with this one bread is just to demonstrate that in a very simple, tangible way. That we all come from different places. And listen, if you say, you know what, I don't know what my ethnic heritage is. I'm just, I'm just, I grew up in America. We didn't celebrate that. Bring some Wonder Bread. It's all good. It's all good. Right? But this is what I believe. I believe that the Spirit is calling and empowering us Kent Covenant Church, to become a reflection of that diverse church at Pentecost. Perhaps the real miracle of Pentecost is not just the disciples' supernatural speaking of languages unknown to them, but in the universal understanding of their speech by those in the crowd, irregardless of their nationality or ethnic heritage. The Spirit beginning at Pentecost, that which will be completed one day when every tongue, tribe, and nation worships the Lamb. May we be a foretaste of kingdom come. Amen.